Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today to tell you about my research in collective behavior. Now, what are these creatures? So, locusts, exactly. A biblical plague, right? Locusts have been around for a very long time, causing trouble. Um, and yet, we still have a very limited understanding of why insects like locusts perform these mass migrations. And this is a really important problem. I study locusts in Mauritania, that you can see there, and this is showing you the range of one species of locust, the desert locust. It's enormous. In actual fact, they can invade up to one-fifth of the Earth's land surface. The FAO estimate that they impact the livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet. And in Science magazine, it was written, even after 50 years of fighting locusts, it's more of an art than a science. This is really surprising to me. And so when I saw this work, I really wanted to ask the question, why do locusts swarm? And we didn't know this. And in actual fact, before they take flight, like you saw previously in the video, this is time-lapse footage of juvenile locusts hatching out emerging from the eggs, and they'll dry themselves under the sun and then begin to start marching. These are called hopper bands. And we've been studying hopper bands in the laboratory, and these are not the smartest animals out there. We can put them in this sort of particle accelerator for animals, and they'll keep marching around for eight hours a day, thinking they're in this never-ending desert environment. And as you can see, I've developed software that can track the motion of these individuals to give us some understanding as to why they coordinate their activity in this way. And what we found with these studies was very surprising. We found that locusts, we think of them as vegetarian insects, but we discovered that, in fact, they're very, very cannibalistic. They're chowing down on each other. And maybe this drives locust swamps. And so I went out to Mauritania to try to study these insects in the, the field. And it was a, an amazing trip. And we found locusts, which actually is more difficult than you may expect in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's me filming locusts in the field. And that's one of my colleagues. And that's our camel. And you can see in the background, you can see the footprints of locusts in the sand, which is one of the ways in good weather that you can actually track these swarms. And the swarm that we find was 16 kilometers in perimeter. It's not often that you do field research with a camel. I really did love our camel. Um, but unfortunately for me, I'd been vegetarian for a decade prior to this trip. And it turns out that uh, when there's locust plagues, there's also <laughs> shortage of food. And so we ran out of food, and we ended up, the only thing we could purchase from passing nomadic tribespeople were camel entrails. You can perhaps even see some flies laying their eggs in these entrails here. And we hung them in a tree, and it dries like a sort of jerky, uh, and we ate that. Uh, I became horrifically sick. <laughs> it was the closest to death I've, I've ever come in my life. And when I finally started getting better, well, you can see here, you can tell which tent is mine. Mine is the $50 tent, the one with the, the tent pegs that didn't even go into the sand. My Mauritanian colleagues laughed at me when I, when I put it up. But what you can see in the background here is a sandstorm moving towards us. And you can see we're resourceful biologists. We're using the same tree that we hung the jerky in to dry our, uh, our clothes and sheets there. But theirs was the tent that came down in the storm, and mine, mine stayed up. This is actually not a sandstorm. This is the sandstorm that I, I took from NASA's website. I was in Mauritania for two and a half months. I got 20 minutes worth of data. I am the worst explorer ever. <laughs> <laughs> Here you can see Mormon crickets. And you can see one in the middle there chowing down on, on, on his buddy. And it's beginning to drag it along. Why it drags it along? Well, if it stops, it risks being eaten itself. And we studied Mormon crickets in Utah and Idaho. And as you can see, there are roads. And that makes research significantly easier. 
Um, and you know, here's a roadkill uh, jackrabbit, and you can see the crickets eating off the ears, crawling in through the eyes and the mouth. They have a, a, a real passion, so to speak, for protein. Um, and they would also eat each other. And so we changed the view of how these animals are thought to interact. And so you can see here a sort of living histogram between zero, which is water, and two, which is very strong, two molar, strong concentration of salt. And they taste this with their feet, and you can see them fighting over 0.25 molar concentration. And of course, we randomized the treatments in the actual experiments. I just wanted to, to show this for talks. And why did they like that particular concentration? Well, that turns out to be the concentration of their blood. These organisms are finely tuned to a cannibalistic lifestyle. And so we have a new discovery, an understanding of why locusts and crickets swarm. They're on a forced march. And if you, they're basically trying to attack everyone and try to avoid being attacked. And the outcome is that they all start marching together across the environment. And of course, this is in, in an environment that's uh, doesn't have protein and nutrients that they can access from other sources. If they leave the swarm, they will almost certainly die. And so, in actual fact, if you stop, you risk being eaten by your buddies. And so this is not always the case, thankfully. It's not always the case that animals are trying to eat each other within swarms. When you look at schooling fish and flocking birds, such as these starlings, we see coordinated behavior that's not driven by cannibalism. And so we've been trying to understand how do these groups function? And one of the things we've been trying to study is how does leadership emerge in the natural world? And so I'm gonna show you some individuals that are colored white, that are wanting to move in a preferred direction. And the other individuals colored green don't know where to go. And the big green cross just shows you the center of the group. What this model showed us is that information can be transferred, they can communicate without using language, without using anything complex, information can be transmitted across groups. We've also found out, in fact, that if the white individuals want to get up to that white target and the red ones to their red target, groups can even come to consensus. If we were to decide together, say, where to go to a restaurant tonight, how would we do that? I would ask you a question, you'd maybe put up your hands, I would do a bit of mathematics and pass back the answer. These organisms do not have the capacity to do that, yet effectively they can vote and choose the majority direction just through their motion. And so we've been really fascinated by this. How can simple organisms come to consensus? Is there such a thing as a democracy in the animal world? Well, we are all familiar with democracy and with group decision making. And anyone that sat on a committee like this knows that there are often conflicting interests. And that's the same case within animal groups. But failing to achieve a consensus can be very costly. If you don't elect any government at all, or if you don't come to any decision in these groups, it can be a disaster. But individuals could be susceptible to a strongly opinionated subset of that population. So how does the strength of opinions work? And particularly, I want to ask the question is, are uninformed individuals or those who have weak preferences vulnerable to manipulation by opinionated individuals? Because the current paradigm, which is, by the way, supported by no data whatsoever, is that um, <laughs> Uninformed individuals allow extremist views to permeate through populations. So I wanted to ask the question in a scientific way, how do we expect these types of dynamics to occur? And there are many systems where individuals uh, influence each other, uh, and you know, we can represent it by a sort of network. And what sort of systems am I talking about? Well, we have technological systems, where components are interacting with each other. Neural systems, your neurons are influencing each other's activity. And also human societies. 
And so we want to model how do these types of groups, and I'm really talking about how do neurons, how do people, how do animals communicate with each other, and to get a first approximation to sort of try and explore how these interactions work, we develop a computational model. Now, I don't want to take you through what that model uh, entails, but uh, it's very, very simple. And it's one of those times where you kind of wonder, why has no one done this before? So I'll describe to you how the model works. I have a certain opinion. And say I interact with, with Terry, and he has a different opinion to me. He has a small probability of changing my opinion and vice versa, me changing his. Now, if I interact with him and somebody else, and they both have a different opinion, that has a synergistic effect that's more likely to change my opinion. Okay, that's all we're assuming within this model. It's a very uh, uh, simple type of model. But because we're dealing with a large number of interacting components, it turns out, now I want you to study these, I want you to study these equations in great detail. There'll be, there'll be questions afterwards. Um, <laughs> Indeed. And that's one of the pleasures of, of working somewhere like Princeton. You can have incredibly talented graduate students. I, I can't solve these equations either. Um, and what we discovered was that uh, when you have a decision and everybody has information, if you're in a group and everybody has information, the majority will tend to win. Because as I described to you before, without being able to count, animals can effectively vote through their motion. However, so that's represented by one, the majority winning. But what happens if we increase the, the strength of the opinion of the minority, if they become more intransigent, more opinionated? Well, you know what? It works. If everybody has information, becoming opinionated actually helps you get your own way. And what we then asked, well, what about if we add uninformed individuals or individuals who are informed but don't have a strong preference? They will listen to both sides of the story. Well, as you may expect, adding uninformed individuals, so here we have the minority winning. Um, so as I said, being strongly opinionated seems to work. But as we add uninformed individuals, well, nothing changes. But then we get to a critical point a tipping point where adding a few more uninformed individuals transitions the population behavior back to majority control. So quite counterintuitive. Adding individuals into a decision-making process that don't have a strong opinion can completely transition the entire group or the entire population to a different regime. And so we have a testable prediction Uninformed individuals should inhibit the influence of a strongly opinionated minority by returning control to a numerical majority. And well, we're interested in how this type of behavior works in the natural world. And you know, I'm a biologist. I don't really believe these models until we can test them experimentally. And fish have got wonderful memories. We can train them in just six trials to have a strong preference for a blue or a yellow target we can change the strength of these preferences and combine individuals together and make predictions about how they behave. And on the left here, you see the predictions from the theory, which was, as I showed you before, as we add uninformed individuals, we return control from a strongly opinionated minority to the majority. On the right, you see our first experimental data point. So this is where everybody has information. There are no uninformed individuals, and you can see the minority tends to dominate. But if we add five or 10 stupid or uninformed <laughs> individuals, we, as predicted by our theory, return control to the majority. And so we have a new understanding of how uninformed individuals participate and have a very strong influence in collective decision making. They inhibit extremism and promote democratic consensus decision-making. And you know, I often get asked whether this relates to US politics. <laughs> and uh, well, we don't know that for sure, but you know, we can always ask. But no, we're really thinking about things like committees or even juries making decisions. And so we're testing these ideas 
uh, and also lots of other ideas that we've been coming up with to try to understand what we call socially contagious behavior. There are many examples, fashions, fads, opinions, ideas, political views that spread through crowds. And so we're also studying, in this case, we've developed software that can track the motion and also the head direction of people. We're exploring the hidden interactions of collective behavior. Um, and so thank you very, very much for listening.